I mean, if I had to choose, I guess I'd say my favorite serial killer is Ted Kaczynski. Rest in peace, Big Yuna. Dude, rest in peace, Big Yuna. Praying for you, Ted. But I don't know if he counts as a serial killer, you know? He was like a ideological terrorist, I guess you could say. Body count was only three. Limb count was probably higher. Yeah, I wouldn't consider him like a serial killer, but that answer kind of tells you everything you need to know. We just don't have as many serial killers as we used to. What happened to us? Did cops get better? Is this Mindhunter's fault? I read somewhere that like lead poisoning is considered to be the biggest factor in why violent crime rose in that period. Don't fact check me on that, I'm just believing it. You know what else you read recently? That was good. That was good. I gotta give you credit. Uh, yeah, I read Bretty Snellis' newest novel, The Shards, and this book actually came out earlier this year. I, um, I've just been putting it off. Uh, you can tell that the trawler, which is the name of the serial killer in this narrative, is a bit inspired or based on some of the serial killers in Los Angeles at the time, namely The Night Stalker and The Hillside Strangler. You went to a book event for this book, didn't you? Yes, so I went to Brett's one and only California book event he did for this book. I think he did like five total, um, which was held at the New Roads School in Santa Monica. It's a small private school um, in like a smallish sort of performing arts theater that maybe a hundred or so people showed up to. And it was just an interview between him and Rachel Kushner and... Overall, it was fine. I mean, I guess. I don't know that I thought I was going to learn anything new, but the very last question he got uh, was fascinating in how he responded. Which was? You know, he talked at length about growing up in the 70s and 80s and, and being gay in that moment and how it was unthinkable that you could be out about that. Uh, and that's a big part of this novel, is the character Brett is ostensibly in a relationship with the hot popular girl, uh, while he's also hooking up with a couple other dudes and fantasizing about several others. He literally has a jack-off journal. Um, and so the last question that Brett got at the book event, at the interview, was basically setting him up for this answer. Someone basically asked him, it was like, what's the difference between kids these days and, and kids in your days? And Brett, cipher of the young that he is, did the old man thing, uh, where he's like, kids these days, you know, they don't live in an expressive world. They can't say dangerous things or talk about dangerous ideas. They can't do offensive things, and everyone's so coddled, and it's... <laughs> Like, it's ludicrous. It sounds like a joke because it's like, dude, you have literally spent the better part of the last hour talking about how you didn't have the freedom to be gay because of social pressure. But somehow, when people can't be offensive in the same ways as when you were growing up, that's like a failure of freedom of expression. It's just, it's not even peasant brain shit. It's like stupid, boring, reactionary boomer logic. Like, I think he just fetishizes the secretiveness and forbiddenness of being gay back then. Yeah, it's like more of the things that were forbidden back then have all just been demystified now. Exactly. See? You get it. Before I get you off on your own rant, what were some of the things that you actually liked about this book? I mean, overall, the story's competently told. You know, it's very evenly paced for a 600-page novel and didn't feel like that much of a struggle. It's also a decent balance between, like quintessential Brett Easton Ellis and like airport murder thriller. It reminds me most of Lunar Park, which was similarly a combination of like faux memoir and horror. And both of these books explicitly invoke Stephen King's influence on Brett Easton Ellis. The other good stuff is just what Brett is normally good at, you know, that is gratuitous violence, very exactingly detailed, descriptions of 1980s Los Angeles, a killer soundtrack, natural teenage sounding dialogue. You know, the last hundred pages or so, honestly, were quite breathless in their excitement. Uh, I read them on a plane ride home. Like I said, it's all very competent, but the enjoyment of it, I think, ultimately comes down to whether typical genre conventions, murder, mystery, and horror, enthrall and excite you. All right, so give me a rough overview of this novel. So the book takes place in the fall of 1981 during Brett Easton Ellis' senior year of high school. He is a member of the cool crowd by proximity to the it couple, Susan Reynolds and Tom Wright, and he is dating Debbie Schaefer, horse girl and the daughter of a famous and closeted Hollywood producer. 
Brett's parents are out of town for the entire two months of the novel, so he has the whole house to himself. And Brett's also hooking up with different guys on the side, one of whom gets murdered early on in the book by what Brett suspects is an infamous serial killer known as the Trawler. There's also a new student named Robert Mallory that shows up to the school, and he starts to get close with Brett's peer group. Brett, however, has immediate bad vibes around him and even kind of suspects that he's involved with the killings. So on the one hand, you know, you have the growing tension of the peer group driven by various amounts of infidelity. And on the other hand, you have the deepening mystery of the series of killings that the trawler is conducting or performing, especially when one of the students in Brett's side piece ends up dead. So Brett takes it on himself to kind of be the investigator and is, you know, telling the whole story 40-ish years after the fact. You have what we might call a mixed relationship with Brett Easton Ellis's work, don't you? Sure. I mean, like, obviously, I did a video a couple years ago called A Reader's Introduction to Brett Easton Ellis, and I gave all my thoughts on his fiction up to that date, so you can check that out. But I think I made the point in that video that most of what I like about Brett is his early stuff, basically like the three first books. But I like reading everything, especially by him, because he was so important to me at a younger age, and he was one of these writers that motivated me to want to write my own stuff. So I didn't come into this expecting it to be good, but Brett, for me, at this point, is just someone I read because I want to know his whole career arc. So you bought this book knowing that you'd hate it? I mean, hate's a little bit of a strong word, but I knew I would probably be antagonistic to it. I think that Brett has just lost his fastball. Especially in this, there's some big missed opportunities that a better writer could do something with. In these big missed opportunities, what in your wizened mind was ever so wrong with this novel? Well, and look, I mean, far be it from me to suggest how a book could have been written. I'm not a novelist. But you do try to be, don't you? Yeah. Come on, you set me up for that. I just don't understand why, if you're Brett Easton Ellis, you're not going to spend, like, any time on the cult. The cult is the coolest thing. And they're basically a throwaway line at the end to make the plot make any kind of sense. But we don't know anything about them. We don't learn anything about them. They don't have to have a smart ideology. That's not what I'm saying. But let us at least talk to them or see them or understand why seemingly big plot points hinge on them. I know for a fact that one of Brett's favorite, most influential novels is The Names by Don DeLillo, which I also did a video about, uh, and you should check that out too. And that book is all about a cult that goes around murdering people for reasons that are unclear to the main characters at first. So Brett's read books that portray this stuff, and yet the cult that exists in this book, it's called Writers of the Afterlife, it just feels like a lazy, underdeveloped plot device. And I'm getting into spoilers here, but like, okay, so the whole book's central mystery is about whether the new kid, Robert Mallory, is in fact the serial killer that Brett thinks he is. So circumstantial evidence builds, and it gives us the impression that he is the murderer when in fact it's revealed by the end that the cult performs all the murders, okay? We're just told that the cult considers Robert the god, and... That's how it explains why people in Robert's proximity die, because they're stalking him. Why are they stalking him? Why do they think he's a god? Who can say? Who can say why anyone believes anything? They just do that. For all the shit that Brett, the character, makes up in his head in this book, there's no, like, wild authorial imagination about why this might have happened. Presumably, it's because Robert's hot, and crazy shit happens when you're hot. The Brett Easton Ellis story. Feel better? Yeah, I think I'm good. So what is it that you like about the early stuff that you feel is missing in the later stuff? I don't even know if there's something missing. It's all just kind of retreaded, which, if you think about it, makes sense. Most people don't read everything that an author writes like I do. So when Brett's doing his third consecutive faux memoir as a novel thing, like, there's no shine on it to me. But if you've only ever read American Psycho before, maybe this is something you like. Overall, I just think he kind of tends to write the same book over and over again, but just during slightly different times in his life. Nothing's missing. It's all there. Again. <laughs> maybe that's the thing that Brett is offering up. The same old nostalgia of when you first read him. Do you think Brett's politics play into how you feel about this novel? 
I mean, I think it would be naive to say that it doesn't, though I don't exactly have political problems with this book. Honestly, this is probably his most political piece of fiction, uh, if only because he says like two or three times how disconnected he was or is from politics. Like that's the thing with the cult, right? Is that there's no underlying ideology or explanation for it. It just is. Violence just happens as this spontaneous aesthetic expression of the culture. The actual believers have nothing to say. Like he talks about having no thoughts or feelings about Reagan being president, and yet his books are so much about the Reagan era. His books concern the extreme privilege of the wealthy, and that wealth is fundamentally a political choice of some manner, and the 1980s were when that wealth and inequality started really accelerating. But I do think those politics inform his or his character's understanding of the world as something more intractable than it is. He grew up in a world that was fundamentally hostile to guys being out and gay, and it does feel a bit like without that external pressure, he doesn't have something to fight against in the same way. Which is why I think he tends to wade into the really dumb culture war stuff of, kids these days are such big wusses. I think Brett is just a case where he has over-identified with his struggle. Like, yeah, gay people have achieved more liberation and equity in terms of social treatment, but it makes society softer and unable to deal with difficult truths. That's my Brett Sonella's voice. And it's like, no, dude, I think the thing that you struggled with was vastly improved through political means in your lifetime, despite your complete apathy to politics. And you formed so much of yourself while struggling with your sexuality that you now feel like you have nothing to struggle against. The politics took your struggle away from you. So how would you rate the book? I gave it two stars out of five, sticking with the Goodreads description of, it was okay. I think other people will like it better than me, especially if they know less about the author. This does not feel like a Brett Easton Ellis essential, but then again, nothing feels essential about Brett Easton Ellis, to me at least, since like... 91, maybe 94. I mean, he feels essential in that he exemplifies how many people are way too obsessed with the 80s. Because it's about teenagers, you can get a little like YA-ish vibes from it, but I don't think you can avoid that when you're writing about teenagers, so I'm not holding that against him. I think it helps to have read both American Psycho and Less Than Zero to maybe appreciate the novel a little more. But if you want to read a faux memoir of Brett's, then I would suggest checking out Lunar Park and see if the description of that book sounds better or more appealing. It may not, but you do have choices in this little subgenre that he's created. What are some questions you still have after reading this novel? Yeah, is Steven Reinhardt supposed to be the one that's taking pictures of everybody? Because he's the only one we see with a camera in the book, and a bunch of photos that were taken secretly end up being a big plot point, and I feel like that's the implication of who it has to be. But maybe the novel's not even that smart. Maybe that was the writers of The Afterlife, too. Or maybe Steven is the writers of The Afterlife. The Shards by Brett Easton Ellis. I read it, so you don't have to. More like the shards, am I right, other self? He's gone. He's gone. I really am just talking to myself now.